Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Westside Baptist Church Bible Study Time. What a glorious day it is here at Westside Baptist. We feel like we've turned the corner on the COVID, and uh, praise God for that. Give Him glory for it. And we're breaking out into new classes today. The the adult wing. We have several classes going, and the excitement. A lot of new people we're seeing. We have a guest with us today. His name is Jeff. He's with us today, and he feels very welcome. He said, "God bless you, Jeff." And uh, we're going to start off with prayer needs today. Prayer needs. Let's start off with the. Uh, let's. Uh, we have a praise for Bianca Goodwin. That's Bianca Goodwin. I looked it up. We baptized her here at three ten thirteen about nine years ago, almost to the day. Uh, she got accepted in Harvard this week. How exciting that is. I'm so glad she's grown the way that she has. And I know God has great things in store for her. Bianca, good one. Pray for her and give God glory for what he's done. Remember the Annie Armstrong offering? Our goal was $1,500. Pray about what God wants you to give and give from a generous, loving heart. And that all goes to North American missions. Remember the lost in our community in our families, where we go to school, uh, where we live and so forth. Pray for them. Remember George App? We, he's continuing to improve, had a pacemaker put in. Uh, praise God for his improvement. Remember his wife, if you will, Betsy, that uh, God would continue to strengthen her. Remember the new believers in our church, that they would grow to be what God wants them to be. Any other prayer needs today? Remember Rick, he's had some shingles. Thank everybody for prayer last week. Hopefully I'm closer than I was hoping. Almost. All right, praise the Lord. We're still praying for you, Rick. All right, anyone else before we pray? Remember the Ukraine? These poor people. I can't hardly watch the news without tearing up, especially when I see the women and children, the way they're being done. I just pray for that whole situation. Anyone else today before we pray? All right, then, as we go to the Lord in prayer, Brother Al Carpenter, would you lead us in prayer? Amen. All right. I sound a little funny today. I have allergy issues. Those few warm days that we had, the uh, maple trees got fuzzed up and, and it hit me big time. I had a COVID test, no COVID, a flu shot and all that. But just pray for me and my uh, allergies that I'm dealing with. So today, session two, it's about shared, shared. The theme is this. The gospel is to be boldly shared with compassion and grace. Compassion and grace. So the gospel. Last week in my sermon, indoor sermon, I spoke about the gospel. The gospel shoes that we should be wearing. But uh, we find in the New Testament the word gospel is used 90 times. Every time it means good news. Every time. Good news about what? Anybody? <coughs> it was good news about what? Amen. That's what the gospel is all about. Good news about the death, the burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And the gospel is the only place you'll find peace with, with God. That's how you come to God is believing and, and obeying the gospel. So today we're looking at 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12. And along with sharing the gospel, we need to consider the great model for ministry that we have right here for us. How that Paul and his companions ministered to the new creatures in Christ, the new believers. And uh, we need to look at that, I believe, as a church on how to minister to those that have just come to Christ. And we're going to see it laid out for us in a very simple and practical way. Now, suffering and persecution, they go hand in hand. And every believer, we're going to go through some of that. And I, I know it's not a popular sermon topic or anything like that, but you know what? According to 1 Peter 1, 6 and James 1, 2, Peter spoke about the various trials, multicolored trials that we go through as a believer. And Peter said, rejoice in those trials because that's how God develops your character. Just like refining gold, you heat the gold up and the impurities come to the top to the surface and you see you can take those impurities out of the gold likewise with our lives james 1 2 tells us to rejoice in the trials that we go through doesn't make sense at the time but you look back over your life i think you'll find that you grew the most during the challenging situations of life again it refines us it develops our character so we're going to see that in our lesson today key doctrine today very simple evangelism and missions the lord jesus christ has commanded the preaching of the gospel to all nations again the gospel is the good news as the brother al said the good news about jesus it's all about him so we are commanded by god to to uh, co preach the gospel to all the nations the first thoughts today persecution leads to a stronger and more faithful church we spoke about it individually but collectively as a church as we go through the persecution and the suffering together it develops us it says here it doesn't make sense on the surface and it certainly does not fit the plans of those who uh, oppose christ i mean people that come up against the preaching of the gospel as they persecute the believers they're not considering how much it's going to help those believers grow if you study the book of Acts very carefully, you'll find that the, the devil tried every way he could to stomp out Christianity. Uh, internal division, external uh, fighting and so forth, persecution. But it was like spreading wildfire. You ever tried to put out a wildfire? I remember we had first moved to the woods and I was burning out fence rows. And I wasn't watching as closely as I should have. And that fire spread. Next thing you know, I'm out there with buckets of water and a, and a watering hose trying to put out the fire. I think I have it. Then I look over there. There's another fire going. Then over there. That's the way it was. The devil tried to stomp out Christianity through persecution, but he, uh, he uh, hurt his cause very much because God used it to spread the gospel. It's easy for a church or an individual to be content where we are in the Lord. But it's when we go through the tough times that we grow up in the Lord. All right, those are first thoughts. Now, last week, chapter 1, we discussed how that Paul was just there in Thessalonica for a very brief time, perhaps three weeks, four weeks, uh, and the persecution came so intensely, he had to move on. He just left Philippi where they had mistreated him, and now he was run off from Thessalonica. But you know what? In that short amount of time, God's... Uh, spirit moved in such a way many were saved they came to the saving knowledge of jesus christ and a church was established the apostle was so concerned about them that he wrote letters to them that's what we're looking at today uh, any questions so far any questions okay then so in chapter one he starts the church chapter two he's writing a letter back to them to help disciple them to help disciple them and in this we're going to find a model for ministry. Number one in your books, persistent. Paul and his uh, comrades were persistent in sharing the gospel and loving God's people. Verses 1 through 2. For you yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our visit with you was not without result. 
On the contrary, after we had previously suffered and were treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, we were emboldened by our God to speak the gospel of God to you in spite of great opposition. So notice here the manner, the, the manner of the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Notice here that uh, he's not claiming any victory for himself or any glory for himself. He's giving all the glory to God. And he said, the visit that we had with you, even though it was brief, guess what? It had great effect. And they are the proof of the ministry of God, of the gospel. Many got saved, okay? He says, uh, on the con after we had previously suffered and were treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, we were emboldened by our God to speak the gospel of God to you in spite of great opposition. What's he talking about there? What's he talking about? He didn't let the hard times stop him. He didn't let the persecution stop him. And I'm here to tell you, dear friends, every time you share the gospel, there will be opposition. Why is that? Why does it rub people so wrong to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, one thing, we're living in a world system that's contrary to God. A world system controlled by the devil. And he does not want the gospel to go out. Why is that? Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. The power of God unto salvation. Now, the Apostle Paul cared about people. He cared about people. If you want to look at a model for ministry, here's the, the Apostle Paul and, and his comrades. They genuinely cared for people, and they could tell it. People know if you really care about them or not. They were not like the false apostles that were out there. And the Apostle Paul said in first, uh, uh, let me give you the verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through uh, 2, that faithfulness is the most important quality of an ambassador for Christ, of a servant for, uh, of God, being faithful in your service. Now, it, when you bring that home to what we're talking about today, the Apostle cared about people, and, and he spoke uh, about the care of the church as being greater than all the difficulties that he faced. Now you consider the way Paul had suffered, the trials he'd been through, but yet he speaks in, in, the, in the word of God about the daily care of the churches being the, the greatest challenge that he had. All these different churches, he, I mean, it, it wasn't just a name on a, on a piece of paper to him, it was people. Don't ever miss that. The church is the people. This is just the building where we meet. It's God's house. But it, it's just the building. that The church is the people now. And, and the challenge for each of us is that we need to plant the seeds of the gospel. We need to water those seeds knowing that some of those are going to come at, up maybe uh, years after we're gone. But you know what? It's still great to be a part of something. Uh, that's going to live on forever in heaven. So we need to plant and water the seeds. The fruition of those seeds may happen long after we're gone. So persistence. Be persistent in sharing the gospel. You share the gospel with somebody and they don't get saved immediately, don't quit. Just think how many years people worked with you. Just think about the patience of God as he worked with you and me. People don't usually come to Christ the first time they hear the gospel. It's rare. Usually it's been a, a period of time when, when God uses a whole cloud of witnesses in your life to share the gospel, to water the seeds of the gospel. And then that day, a glorious time, when you come forward in a worship service or, or at home or in a car, wherever you are, and you give your heart to Christ, everybody sees, we get excited People get baptized, we clap our hands, a glorious time. But you know what? Long before that ever took place, people have been working in the life of the ones that have come to Christ. Don't ever forget that. So don't give up. Be persistent about it. And let God the Holy Spirit have time to work in that individual's life. You work with the Holy Spirit. Don't work against him. Don't try to be the Holy Spirit in somebody's life but work with the Holy Spirit. So any comments on that? All right, then. Second point, gentle. Not only were they persistent, 
they were also gentle, gentle. Verse 3, for our exhortation didn't come from error or impurity or an intent to deceive. Instead, just as we had been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please people, but rather God who examines our hearts. So gentleness that would typify the Apostle Paul's ministry. Now, I'm here to tell you the things he went through in life. He had to have skin like, like an alligator to, to, to survive it. The beatings and the scourgings and the stonings and the things he went through, the things said about him, the way his name was slandered. I mean, all these things. And, and an old pastor told me one time, I still remember it, he said, you have to have an alligator hide, <laughs> but he said, you have to stay soft and tender on the inside. You have to be tough on the outside, but don't get so tough on the inside that, that you can't be gentle with people. Uh, and here we, we have the gentleness at the, the, uh, in sharing the message of the gospel. Notice, been entrusted with the gospel. You know, you may not have thought about it lately, but the gospel is a treasure. It is a treasure. The Apostle Paul, of course, was given this gospel by the Lord Jesus Christ, but you know what? It wasn't his. It was the gospel that belonged to God. He calls it the gospel of God, and, and it belongs to him. The gospel, again, being the good news about the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and been entrusted with it. Now, you and I, as born-again believers, you don't have to have a title to be entrusted with the gospel. You don't have to be a pastor, a preacher, uh, evangelist, missionary, none of that. Any born-again believer can say this with, with, with great confidence. God has entrusted me with the gospel. And that's immediately, immediately. The moment that you're saved, guess what you have? You have a testimony. Testimony, how you came to know Christ in your life. And you're given the gospel, just tell people, what you've been told, share with them about the gospel. So we speak not to please people. Now what happens if you spend your whole ministry trying to please people? What's going to happen? Well, you're going to be sadly disappointed. And why is that? Because first of all, you can't please people. You really can't. And if you base your ministry on that, you're not going to last very long. Are you going to be up and down like a roller coaster in your ministry? No, you have to focus on pleasing the one who called you, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have found through experience, those that are right with him, you will please them if you're preaching the gospel and loving God's people. He says, speak not to please people. In other words, don't put out a public opinion poll, and then if people want to hear this preached, then preach on that. No, it's just the opposite. Actually, you get alone with God. Get in the Bible, praise, and speak to God about it, and then preach what God has put on your heart because that's what God wants people to hear. All right? He says, but rather God, please God with it, who examines our hearts. I'm speaking here about accountability. Now imagine going through life and you're trying to please people your whole ministry. That ministry, again, every born-again believer has one. We all have a ministry. You're trying to please people, and perhaps, uh, for the most part, you've been able to keep people happy. But then you stand before Almighty God, and he's unhappy with you because you're trying to please people instead of him. So what profit would you have? Well, you would have no profit, no profit to you. But you know what? If you preach the word of God from a loving heart and loving God's people, one day you'll stand before Almighty God and I think you'll have a smile on his face because you sought after his leadership and his blessing in your life. Any comments on that? Excuse me just a moment. <coughs> now then, no, no comments on being gentle? Verses 5 through 6, we'll see the method, the method of Paul. Look at verse 5. For we never use flattering speech. What is it to flatter somebody? What does that mean if you flatter somebody? You know, flattering somebody I've always felt like is when you say something to their face, but you don't say it behind their back. You might be trying to gain favor with somebody or 
or get something over on them so you flatter them. But you know what? Flat, flattering speech, he says, we never used it with people, as you know, or had, or had greedy motives. And that's just the opposite of the false apostles and preachers of that day and this day. Greedy motives. That, you know, the Bible speaks about making merchandise of people. And what does that mean? Just using people to get things. And that's just the opposite of what we should do. We should use everything that we have at our disposal to bring people to Christ. So he's just the opposite of the false preachers of his day and our day. He says, God is our witness. And we didn't seek glory from people either from, from you or from others. All right. So speaking here about the method of ministry, just being real with people, honesty and integrity. I think people can tell if you're sincere about what you're doing, if it's real or whether it's some sort of a sales pitch or whatever. And uh, one thing I'm concerned about today as I've been in my entire ministry, it, 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 one thing I want to bring up is that sometimes preachers try, or, or other believers try to bear witness to two lights. And I've heard sermons before. I can't really call them a sermon because all that speaker ever talks about is what he did. I did this, I did that, I accomplished this. I you know what? I don't want to hear that. What little bit we can accomplish to the glory of God, give him all the glory for it that he could use an unworthy vessel like us to do something for his kingdom. I want to hear people speak about the glory of God. I want to hear about Jesus. I want to bear witness to the light of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what it's all about. That's what Paul was doing here. That's what Paul was doing. All right, any questions then? Verse 7. Again, how do you do ministry, pastor? Look at verse 7. Although we could have been a burden as Christ's apostles, instead we were gentle among you as, nur as a nurse nurtures her own children. NASB says it this way. Gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Either way, you see that Paul treated people in a very gentle manner like, like, like a nursing mother. Think about that for a minute. As a nursing mother, I can't think of a more uh, nurturing or more gentle uh, adjective to be used or a metaphor on how to do ministry. What does a mother do? She caresses that baby. She loves that baby. And they bond immediately, right after birth. I mean, they, they, they put that baby in the mother's hand, arms, and she holds that baby, and instantly they are bonded together. And that's the way ministry should be. As a nurse nurtures her own children, that's the way we need to be with new believers in the church. Excuse me just a moment. That's the way we need to be with new believers. And what am I talking about there? They're new creatures in Christ. They're just babes in Christ on the milk of the word. And we should stay on the milk as well as the meat. That It speaks about purity. But as you look at this, uh, they're, they're, uh, what, what is it about a baby? Well, a baby, a human baby is about the most helpless thing on planet earth. They can't do anything for themselves. They're just a bundle of needs. <laughs> they need everything done for them. Likewise, new believers, the devil, first of all, he's out to get them. He can't take their salvation, but he wants to take their witness if he can. He wants to take their morale or, or spirit, uh, spiritual uh, life, what, however you want to say it. Uh, he wants to make them ineffective in the kingdom, so he's out to get them. Now, we as a local church, we need to nurture we need to nurture God's new believers. You remember what uh, Peter spoke, uh, Jesus spoke to Peter about how that Peter was to feed my lambs, then feed my sheep. You really love me, Peter? You know I do, Lord. Then feed my lamb, feed the little ones, and also feed my sheep. Okay, we have to nurse them and take care of them. And that's why, um, excuse me again, <coughs> that's why I'm so concerned about our classes here at Westside. I'm so glad we can break out 
in the individual classes again. Yes, they'll still hear, hear the preaching of the word and so forth, but you get them in the small group, and there's something about a small group that helps us open up. Pray for one, one another's needs and encourage one another. And that is a great place for new believers to get involved in. Get in with those that have been through the mill, so to speak. They've been around for a while. They've had some trials. They've been refined somewhat. And they can help you a great deal. Break down into those small groups. And they can get strong encouragement there. Here's the question. Where is the balance between being gentle and being bold? Can a person be both at the same time? How do you guys look at that? Can you be both? Well, I think we should be. Try our best to be. See if you agree with this or disagree. I think we need to be bold in declaring the truth. I mean, without apology. We don't need to apologize for the Bible. It stands on its own. Then gracious in application. As we teach and as we preach, as we fellowship, we need to be gracious with one another. Pass the grace around the table because we all need it. Amen. We all need the grace of God. All right then. Let's look at the next point, which is blameless. Blameless. Does that mean they were perfect? No, far from it. The Apostle Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. That, that statement stands on its own merits. Let, think about that. Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. <laughs> but here's what he says in verse 8. We cared so much for you that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. I like to say it this way. Not only should we preach a sermon, we should live a sermon. Preacher, show me a sermon by the way that you live. All right? And that's what they were doing. They shared the word of God, but also their own lives. And that goes way beyond giving their life for somebody. That means living for other people. Any comments on that? Now, how do we do that then? And I know with COVID and so forth, uh, in my personal ministry, I, I mean, I still make hospital visits. I visit nursing homes and uh, the funerals and weddings and all that. I, I kept doing it through all the, the pandemic. But you know what? I found that people, they let me know when they want to visit. Some people are kind of funny about letting you in their house. I understand that. I love to visit people. But they're good about letting you know when they want to visit or when they just want a prayer. Okay, but the, the thing is, you need to be there for people. Be available for people. Any comments? Brother Al. Brother Al. Yeah.
certainly can. Amen. So I, while I perceive you're doing the chaplain's ministry there at Golden Years, you're being a minister to them. You're kind of like a chaplain to them. And, uh, and you're, you're like a, a nursing mother with them, it sounds like. You're helping them. And they can tell that you care. And it's like being a magnet, you know, yeah. yeah when, when you're a loving and caring person, you're like a magnet to people that have needs. You just kind of attract them. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Okay, so it says here that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. So Paul was a people person. He loved people. He invested his life in people. Not that it's easy, but, but it's worth it. It's worth it. Now, just a moment. Verses 9 through 12. For you remember our label, uh, labor and hardship, brothers and sisters, working night and day so that we would not burden any of you. We preach God's gospel to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how devoutly, righteously, and blamelessly we conducted ourselves with you believers. As you know, like a father with his own children, over here like a mother, and now like a father with his own children. We encouraged, comforted, and implored each of you to walk worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Wow, so much in these verses. The Apostle Paul was working bivocational, bivocational. So what was his other line of work that helped him make ends meet? Anybody tell me? What did he make? He was a tent maker. That's right, Steve. He was a tent maker, and that's what helped him make the ends meet. So he was bivocational. Now, he, over here he says he could have been a burden because he's Christ's apostle. He could have demanded pay or whatever, but he didn't. He didn't. Uh, he, he, just, uh, he just let that right go because he loved these people so much. So he was working night and day as not to burden anybody, and during that time, he preached God's gospel to them. And he says, you're witnesses. And so was God, how devoutly, righteously, and blamelessly we conducted ourselves. So there they are. They're, they're, they're like a, a nursing mother and like a loving father. Now, a father in the first century, a good father served as teacher and trainer. He provided both wisdom and discipline. The parent-child relationship has a powerful dynamic like maturing children, new believers need a balance between a tender embrace and a firm challenge. So again, how do you, how do you balance that? Well, you listen, I believe, to the Holy Spirit of God. Pastoring is a whole lot like mothering. I'll be honest with you at times. Sometimes people need a very gentle embrace. Other times they need some firm words, and you need to be firm on things, and uh, but, but that's a whole lot of be a lot like being a father and mother wrapped up in one. That's what Paul's ministry was like. And you read uh, his writings to the churches. Sometimes he's, he's downright, uh, uh, he gets right, right in their face on things as, as he should. Sometimes they needed that. Other times he gave a very gentle embrace he, when he comforted folks. But notice here three words are used. No, notice first of all, devoutly well what does that mean we read over that what does that word mean it means he had he had steered clear of sinful and selfish attitudes people watch us all the time and if you watch me long enough it won't take you long to find out i'm not perfect uh, i'm trying to be but i'm far from it i'm working on it but the thing is he steered clear of sinful and selfish attitudes people can pick up on that selfishness second of all he, he, he performed his work righteously. He had cut no moral corners. Okay, no spiritual compromise. Again, you contrast that with the false leaders of the day. Some of them were, were going around, what were they doing? All they thought about was uh, like, like being a high-pressure salesman, coming across as a high-pressure salesman, just staying long enough to 
put a few dollars in their pocket, then they would be gone. But Paul stayed with the people. Excuse me. Paul stayed with the people because he loved the people. They could see that he was sincere about it. He did it in a righteous way. He didn't cut any moral corners. You know that, that the, uh, the, the, the means justifies the ends or so forth. That No matter what you do, as long as it didn't know, uh, that's terrible to have an attitude like that. We just had an example. It says, to this Paul added that he had lived blamelessly. That means above sin? No, of course not. He said, I'm the chief of sinners, but while opponents might attack his reputation, and they did, they slandered Paul. Those who knew him best, God and the Thessalonian believers, understood he had nothing to hide. So how in the world do you build a certain character in your life to the point that you know things will be said, they don't have to be true, but things are going to be said about you, you'll be slandered. So how do you build a reputation in, 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 uh, in uh, character uh, to the point that when it, when it happens, I'm not going to say if, but when it happens, people that really know you say, that's not true. That is not the person I know. That's not the person I served with all those years. How do you do that? By being real. Being real, excuse me. Real to what God's called you to be. Be a genuine person. Any comments on that? So that is the best uh, action you can take to fight against uh, being slandered. Those that know you real close and truly know it's not, it's not right. It wasn't true. So then Paul mentioned three actions to help the Thessalonians grow in their faith. Courage comforted and implored them. So he did this and again a model for ministry be like a loving mother and a strong leading father. Come in, church. Encourage those that are without Christ to come to Christ. And after they come to Jesus, just uh, be like a comforting mother and a leading father. And see them grow up in the Lord. Now today, perhaps you've heard this lesson. You realize you're not a Christian. You knew uh, you do know now if you were to die, you're not sure if you go to heaven. You're not certain about that. There, I want you to know you can be certain about it today. You can know for a fact if you were to die, you can go to heaven. Well, Pastor, I want to know that right now. I want to know that. Just follow me in this simple sinner's prayer as we all bow together. Pray these words with me with sincerity. And you know what? You can be sure that you're going to heaven. Bow with me right now. Dear God, forgive me for my sins. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sins. I'm ready now to turn to Jesus and trust in the finished work of the cross to get to heaven. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God, for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So if you prayed that prayer today, let me know. Call me, text me, email me. I want to hear about it. My number is 513-265-5051. I just want to encourage you, send you some good Lifeway materials to help you grow up and be what the Lord wants you to be. And I want you to have a good week this week. And if you can stay for the worship service at 1030, we're still on the whole armor of God, the believer's warfare in Ephesians chapter 6. All right, that concludes our Sunday school time.